thank you for having us. It is great to do this collaboration. Um, so ER, as the European Iron Radicalization, as the name suggests, focuses on the radical ideas and groups that uh, lead to violence and instability in Europe. Um, naturally, because this includes a lot of transnational groups and the ideological currents that influence these movements come from outside. Uh, we look at geopolitical circumstances um, and also just foreign um, conflicts and theatres of uh, dispute. Uh, the platform intends really to bring together people from different disciplines and with different experiences, so whether that's academics and scholars or journalists, uh, former extremists um, and counter extremist practitioners, either current or former, to analyze uh, issues and see if we can work towards a solution that can then be shared with relevant policymakers. Uh, an important part of what we do is to try to bridge gaps between uh, people who otherwise wouldn't wouldn't communicate uh, and events like this are very helpful to doing that so we're very glad to be uh, partnering with CEP. Uh, in terms of our outputs, uh, they tend to be either longer reports, uh, sometimes shorter articles and analytical pieces, uh, looking at trends and currents. Uh, and we also have recently started a, a podcast and we do regular webinars um, to bring people together and hopefully to share ideas. As uh, so that does, and if you want to look us up, that would be great. Um, so as you mentioned, my presentation is going to cover the British state's approach to jihadism really since the, the 1990s, uh, because that's when it became a, a major problem. So the Islamist current obviously goes back to the 1920s. Before then, when there was the, the Ottoman Caliphate, it wouldn't have made any sense because Islam is just the, the way of the world. Uh, but once it was gone, the question of what to put in its place was either uh, a secular system as happened in Turkey, and, but others said, well, we would quite like the Caliphate back. Um, and that was the, the origins of the Islamist movement, particularly with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt in 1928. The movement developed, it overlapped and fused in ways with, um, with Nazism and fascism during the 30s and 40s. After the defeat of the Nazis, it found uh, allies often in the Soviets, uh, somewhat counterintuitively given it was a, obviously a religious movement and the Soviets were viciously atheist, um, but it grew as time went on, particularly after the Six Day War in 1967. Uh, and it led to crackdowns, particularly in Egypt and Syria in the 1960s and 70s, that forced some of the brothers to go abroad, into, including into Europe. The, at that time, they mostly settled in places like Germany. For Britain, the main uh, Islamist immigrants were from the subcontinent, um, unsurprisingly, because uh, we had been in India and people had all kinds of connections there. So the, the Brotherhood equivalent in the subcontinent, which was Jamati Islami uh, under Abu al al Madudi, were the, the sort of ideological currents that were mostly in Britain until uh, the later 80s and the 90s. Um, Egypt uh, had a very bad time of it with the Islamists after this, especially when um, the government tried to kind of use the Islamists to blunt the communist advances because the Soviets were colonizing the state. And it led to the murder of President Sadat in 81. Uh, but the two big events that really shape the, the current Islamist movement are the Iranian Revolution in 1979, uh, with the Shah's government deposed the most powerful and openly loyal Western ally. It seemed that if it could happen in Iran, it could happen anywhere. And then a few months later, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan uh, and the occupation that lasted until 1989. And it was in occupied Afghanistan that Al Qaeda formed, which really brings together the the jihadi Salafi movement, which is an evolution out of the, the original Brotherhood style of Islamism. Uh, most accounts say Al Qaeda originated in 1988, specifically in August 1988. They, it, this relies on a series of minutes from meetings in that month. Uh, what they actually show is an organization that already existed, and it traces back to late 1986 when bin Laden set up a, a a camp, basically, a, a military camp uh, called the Lion's Den of Supporters, which is often just called the military base or Al Qaeda al Askariya, which is the origin of the name. Uh, at that time, in terms of the financing, it was basically bin Laden's private fortune. Um, but when Al Qaeda or something approaching what would be Al Qaeda, a kind of special forces, uh, in the spring of 1987, 
fought a battle which is very famous in, in jihadist historiography at Jaji. Um, it was more like a skirmish with the Red Army, but it became a very big event and it drew in a lot of Arab volunteers and crucially a lot of Arab donors um, to the Islamist cause. And from the, the as the Soviet war wound down, uh, Al Qaeda began to look further afield. Uh, in the early 90s, the first attack was actually on US troops in Yemen in 92 as they tried to deploy to alleviate the famine in Somalia. Uh, and in that same period, uh, Bin Laden moved to Sudan which gave him easier access to the Middle East and North Africa. And Al Qaeda began a long relationship with uh, the Iranian revolution, the current government of Iran, uh, including by sending Al Qaeda jihadists to Lebanon to be trained by Hezbollah, which is the, the Lebanese division of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Uh, so after 9 11, the narrative commonly was that Al-Qaeda divided the world between the far enemy, which is the West, specifically the US, and the near enemy, which is the, the local regimes. And its program was to attack the far enemy in order to drive the US out of the region, which would leave these regimes, which Al-Qaeda regarded as basically proxies or clients or colonies of the US, uh, undefended, and that would lead to Islamist revolutions. It's true to an, ex an extent, um, but it is overstated. Al-Qaeda, always had an eye on the local surroundings. And at least by the 9-11 Commission's estimate, maybe 20,000 jihadists were trained for insurgency during the 1990s. And they appeared in places like Egypt, which had to fight another round with the Islamists. Um, there was a very infamous massacre at Luxor in 97, but that was part of it. Egypt did eventually prevail. Also in Chechnya, in Bosnia, which is very important for how Al-Qaeda would develop uh, later on. Uh, and relevant to our purposes today in Algeria. So Algeria had been a, a, Soviet, a Soviet model government and a Soviet aligned government during the Cold War. Um, after the Soviet Union was gone, it tried to chart another path and thought it would hold elections. It became clear they were going to lose the elections to a, an Islamist party called the Islamic Salvation Front or the Thies. Um, so they, they cancelled the elections and uh, trying to just suppress the fees. Uh, that spiraled into a civil war, and the emergence of a group, really the only one before the Islamic State that can claim that kind of hyper-extremist uh, tendency to declare kind of whole populations as heretics. Uh, and a terrible war began <coughs> with the armed Islamic group coming to dominate the insurgency or the GIA, uh, and then a series of bombings in Paris in 1995 by this group uh, changed the the dynamics of the war, because previously there had been efforts to kind of mediate between the insurgents and the government. Um, but Paris decided that the, uh, the better part of wisdom was to essentially call off all of the peace diplomacy and to give the Algerian government the space to, to finish the job. Uh, there are a lot of questions about exactly what the GIA is and its operations, because the Algerian intelligence services very heavily infiltrated the group. Um, and its kind of self-destructive behavior benefited the Algerian government very greatly, but we can park that as a, an issue. The issue was that the bombings did attract French attention and they did kind of draw France into the Algerian war. And it was as the French were helping on intel the intelligence side of things and rolling up the networks in France that had been providing uh, propaganda support and also money, of course, to the, the insurgency, um, that France started to notice that as they were shrinking the space for these uh, jihadists within their country. A lot of them were ending up in London. Um, and it's in this period that the French started to call London, Londonistan, which is a word that has acquired other connotations since, but that was the, the origins of it. Uh, when a lot of these uh, kind of jihadist re refugees, we like from France, started arriving in London, they, they found there were already jihadist networks there. Uh, most notoriously with uh, Umar Othman or Abu Qatada, who was Al Qaeda, he's still leading Al Qaeda cleric. Uh, and he'd been in the country since '93. And they, they gathered, they created propaganda magazines. Again, they raised money for both Bosnia and for the ongoing war in Algeria and for other places. Um, Abu Qatada was quite obscure at the time. He wasn't exactly a public figure, but there were others who were, including uh, Abu Hamza. Uh, he saw the spotlight and he, he got it. Uh, his sermons were notoriously incendiary. 
Uh, and he became a regular feature in the tabloid press where he started to be called Captain Hook because he had lost both his hands and his handling explosives in Afghanistan. Um, so uh, these people like Abu Hamza have said things constantly that could have been interpreted as incitement. They were raising money for effectively terrorism abroad. Uh, Abu Hamza himself went to Bosnia and fought with the, the Mujahideen there that were controlled by the Iranians, um, but none of it seemed to attract much legal attention. Uh, and the question was, why was that? Uh, so in 2011, a uh, analyst called Jakob Lapin wrote a book called Virtual Caliphate. And they spoke to Baroness Caroline Cox, who was the former Speaker of the House of Lords here, when she looked into things after 9-11. Uh, and Lapin reports from that, uh, that there are signs the UK government allowed jihadis in Britain, into Britain and gave them a free hand to set up base on the understanding that Britain itself would not be harmed. Uh, and that was basically the approach uh, up to 2001. Uh, fundraising was allowed, propaganda work, logistical support, even as with Abu Hamza, fighters going abroad and engaging in, we didn't really know what, but we knew it wasn't very good, um, and, and then coming back. And the British state just left them alone, um, so long as the impacts of their fundraising and all the rest of it were abroad rather than here. So that continued even after the, the attacks on the African embassies, even after the coal attack. 9-11 is obviously what changed things. Uh, on the first Friday, so 9-11 was on Tuesday, on the, the Friday of that week, uh, Abu Qatada gave a sermon saying that this was, that the attacks had been part of an eternal war between Christendom and Islam, um, and made other statements that were clearly supportive of murdering non-Muslims. Uh, in December 2001, Britain finally passed a law that said that kind of thing was no longer to be allowed, uh, and he went into hiding. He was finally arrested in October 2002. Uh, it began a, a saga of 13 years trying to deport him, um, and he eventually went actually of his own volition. Um, Jordan had to change his laws in order to, to accept him. Um, Abu Hamza wasn't arrested until August 2004. Uh, the first set of charges against him got dropped. Um, a new set were brought a couple of months later, and then eventually it became clear that actually he was not going to be charged here at all. He was going to be extradited to the US, uh, which he eventually was in 2012. So jihadists had become a concern for the British government clearly after 9-11, um, but their, their focus remained on the old pattern of uh, only really interested in domestic terrorism. Uh, and as we shall see, that actually failed in its own terms. But in the, the meantime, what it led to was a government policy that in conception aimed to promote moderates as a counterweight to violent extremists. Uh, and in practice, it meant engaging with so-called non-violent Islamists and or participationists. The, the idea being, if you gave Islamists a legal pathway to achieve some of their goals, it would make the violent revolutionaries kind of less attractive. It didn't, as I say, it didn't really turn out that way because the best organized people to engage with, to, to take a step back, Obviously, the initial problem is if you're going to do that, it means you're treating the Muslim population as a block and you need representatives to engage with. And the best organized people were the extremists, namely the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, the Brotherhood, when the, their members started coming to Europe in the 60s, hadn't really thought they were staying. But by the 90s, they realized they were and began setting up their own organizations. In Britain, this was the two most prominent were the Muslim Council of Britain and the Muslim Association of Britain, uh, both in 1997. And they were a major part of our report on the Muslim Brotherhood in 2015 that confirmed that they were derived from the Brotherhood initially. Um, it's, kind of, it's difficult to quantify the harm that this policy did. Um, it's, it's obvious the effect it had, which was it legitimized these actors and their narratives, including things like the, the Muslims were under a constant war from the state and this kind of thing. Uh, and it meant that people who wanted influence in public policy kind of had to go through them. It also meant that the state ended up financing these groups because it, for counter-terrorism work or, or counter-extremism as it evolved, state funds became available to these groups. Um, what can be said with some certainty is it didn't do much good um, because the 7-7 attacks then happened in 2005. Uh, but the, the policy largely remained unchanged. Um, with the exception of the introduction of the, the contest strategy or the prevent 
with a, whose most well-known element is prevent, um, which uh, has the problem of all anti-radicalization efforts in that it's very difficult to quantify its rate of success. Uh, and it's become a, a focus of much public agitation by Islamist groups, which I suppose in its way is a confirmation it must be doing something. Um, that, the policy towards Islamists changed in 2010 with the new government, which at least stopped the, the funding of um, groups that didn't adhere to, to kind of liberal democratic values. Uh, but uh, just as the, the, this kind of change kicked in, uh, the war in Syria began and the rise of the Islamic State was to come, which is the, the last major phase of how Britain has handled this. And that was very much more, I mean, at, at that stage, the, the terrorism problem did become front and center. And in that, the, the state handled things generally quite well. Um, the finances were not really an issue because the Islamic State is, is self-financed. It set up its bail afraid, it taxed, quote unquote, the population. It was more like extortion, but they had their own money. They were able to organize, as we know, the attacks in France and in Belgium. And some attacks were effectively free because they were able to just guide people online through encrypted apps. Um, about 900 uh, British citizens went out to, to join the Islamic State, and an unknown number joined Al-Qaeda and like-minded groups in, in fighting the Assad regime. About 400 had come back by 2019 when the, the caliphate was destroyed. We've had 40 prosecutions since then, um, so a tenth. Um, obviously not all of those prosecutions ended in conviction and basically everybody who is, was convicted is either now released or is just about to be. Uh, so the legal complications that we had going back to the 90s uh, and into the 2000s have persisted. Uh, the legal system just can't. It, it, the line you were talking about, a drawing between kind of free expression and uh, the security of the community, we haven't found a very easy way to draw that line. And because as well, a lot of crimes that these people committed were, were in Syria and Iraq, where they were not television screens and where witnesses are not easily accessible, there's not a lot they can be charged with really beyond membership of a terrorist organization, which has a, a quite minimal sentence. Um, as I said, the intelligence side has looked better and the intelligence services now do take an interest in these groups and the sort of sporadic attempts to surveil and to infiltrate these groups that was going on in the 90s is now much more systematic and much more, much more effective just in general. The, the, a lot of these attacks are stopped uh, well short of, of execution. Uh, and even whether or not the intelligence services are often close at hand because they've been surveilling the people who are, who are engaged in it. Uh, there has been some slippage on the, the counter extremism side. The, the decision I mentioned in 2010 to turn away from the Brotherhood derived uh, so called nonviolent sort of interlocutors. Uh, there have been some recent contacts between those kind of groups and some MPs. Uh, it has resulted in some negative publicity and even in uh, certain officials being sacked. So it's sort of, it, it remains murky that that happened at all. So we're we're not quite sure where that was going to go. Uh, in terms of financing, the situation is probably the most worrying, uh, especially because a lot of the financing in Britain is done under the guise of charities, and our charities commission doesn't really have the powers it should to, to deal with this. It can't even really close down charities. It more just puts them in a state of administration and then demands that they change the leadership. And often people will just change the leadership to uh, family and friends. And then the organization pretty much goes on as it was before. And we also don't have a very clear picture um, of the, the financial networks because a lot of it's done by Hawala and other things which have moved cash itself around. So that probably remains uh, one of the serious problems. Um, outside of the government, the most serious problem has been highlighted by uh, Shamina Begum, who is, I think, a case most people will know. Uh, she went on to join ISIS when she was about 15 uh, and she came back recently, uh, excuse me, she was discovered recently in northern Syria. Um, but she's become an object of a lot of public attention from the, the press in Britain, including from the BBC, which has done uh, this podcast series with her. Uh, and it's given her a kind of celebrity status that is, um, I mean, at best, it's just very distasteful because obviously she was involved in an organization that carried out the genocide against Yazidis uh, 
uh, that was engaged in all kinds of crimes against humanity. And now she is being given a lot of space to, to play the victim, really. Um, but it's, it may end up being a bit more dangerous than that because it's just, it's very unclear what she actually thinks. I mean, her, her presentation at this moment of being a kind of victim who was groomed into ISIS is a very recent thing. When she was first found, she said she was very glad that ISIS had uh, done what it had done and she hoped that it would return. Um, so giving her a platform from which she may be able to disseminate her ideas and later on to engage in other logistical and other work for extremists is quite quite a dangerous thing. And again, there's not really much that the state can do about that. It would be more a, a cultural decision not to, not to treat her in this way. Uh, so that would be the end of my presentation. Um, I say there's been some evolution over time uh, and a lot of problems remaining, unfortunately.